Good morning. This is Eric Harrison, and uh, welcome to WFL HCA Wednesday Cardiology Case Conference, June the 15th. We have the pleasure of having uh, Stephanie, who's our ARNP student, University of Tampa today, and we also have uh, David Kennedy, who's our consultant for patients, because he's one of our patients. So we're so glad that he could attend today because we're going to talk about his case. So we're really looking forward to that. So let's go ahead and get started. Dr. Harrison, can you make sure you're recording? I am recording. Thank you, Hassan. And so there are two things uh, that we talk about frequently in this conference, and one is personalized preventive cardiac imaging, and that's actually when uh, we make pictures of people's hearts who uh, have family histories of heart disease or who have risk factors for heart disease. And our screening test is cardiac CT. And uh, so we can basically uh, screen people for having heart disease with very low radiation exposure and personalize their care. The other point is concierge precision cardiology. Uh, precision being a key word now for Congress and for Obama. And uh, that is basically to target specifically uh, certain concepts on personal patient care. And so let's talk about that a little bit today. And uh, that's where our patient comes in. And we're going to talk about his case. So I want people to know that we have a large group of people nationally that I'm involved with, both in cardiac imaging, cardio-oncology, cardiac surgery, and uh, opening Standard, standing vessels and opening chronic total occlusions and uh, also uh, involvement with EP. And so these are some of our people that we work with. And why is it that I would choose other people outside the community uh, to work with? And so I thought I'd give you a few ideas of why that is. And so this is Tampa Bay. And once upon a time when we first got started here, we had open heart surgery only at Tampa General Hospital. And so it was a regional referral area for entire Tampa Bay. We had uh, patients coming from everywhere in a very big volume. As a matter of fact, we even had a lot of patients with adult congenital heart disease who never had uh, definition and repair of that. And so uh, it was kind of a, a, a very unique program with thousands of patients a year. Since that time, there's been uh, some changes. And so let's talk about the changes. One has been the proliferation of open heart surgery programs because basically uh, that's where the money is and so the hospitals will go find money and so that's also where some prestige is and so we have all these hospitals one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven to thirteen hospitals probably more in this Tampa Bay area who are dividing the pie and so it used to be only one big pie in one hospital, and now they're divided by 13. So slices are getting thinner and thinner. And so, but not only that, but in terms of cardiac surgery procedures, there's been a dramatic decline. And so let's look at isolated bypass grafting. And uh, that's up here in 1999, the blue line. As we follow this blue line down, we find that it looks like it's uh, in half in 2014. So that means we need half as many surgery centers and we need half as many bypass surgeons. And indeed, looking at angioplasty without acute coronary syndrome, basically it peaked at about 2005 and that's on a dramatic decline as well. And so people with chronic stable angina can be taken care of medically and do just as well as if they had surgery. And so that's the approach according to uh, the COURAGE study and other studies that we have. We also have studies that support that 50% of the stents that we've been putting in don't need to be put in and don't change anything. Uh, patients could be managed medically. And so decline, decline. Uh, and as you know, if you don't have big volume, you have high mortality. So the mortality rate on small volume is very high. And as you have big volume at places like Houston and Cleveland and Atlanta, New York, you know, you get low mortality. And so unfortunately, these are not 
consistent with the proliferation of programs basically for prestige and money. And so then every program, instead of having a concentration of five or six surgeons at one hospital, we've got two surgeons at every hospital. And their experience then is divided by two, and then it's divided by the decline of cardiac procedures, and the same way with cardiologists. And so new cardiologists coming out in practice have a hard time uh, finding work and uh, basically having enough volume. And so here's angioplasty, here's open heart surgery, and here's mortality. And the same holds for volume doing cardiac cath and angioplasty. So that explains why I'm looking for high volume centers where people actually have a tremendous commitment at their institution for quality. Whereas today, if you have a small hospital, there may not be much commitment at all. And so you have two surgeons struggling to get what they need in terms of 3D echo in the operating room and uh, other uh, adjuvants. So let's start in with our case for this morning. And we have uh, David Kennedy here. And we can talk a little bit about uh, David. Uh, he's 75 years old. And he has a history of some chest discomfort about 10 years ago. He may have had a spec scan at that time, and he had some uh, blockages that were seen on cardiac cath. I got angioplasty and stenting of the mid LAD in the proximal right coronary artery without any problems. He's a master swimmer. He swam, uh, I think, in high school and college, and continues to swim and keeps himself in great shape. Recently, he's been getting some shortness of breath when swimming, and uh, that started out minimally, but now it's gotten more significant to where he can't swim or even get started without getting some symptoms. David, could you say a few words about what your symptoms have been? What do you feel when you get in the pool now? Well, it was uh, first it started out as kind of muscle soreness when I was getting started, and I knew that that shouldn't be happening, so I just felt like my muscles were not getting enough oxygen. Then I began to get tightness right in the center of my chest when my pulse rate would get up to about 140, 150. And as soon as I stopped, and not as soon, but within minutes after I stopped, it would start to diminish. So, uh, that was basically the symptoms. Other than that, a normal uh, life living, it, it didn't, I didn't have any symptoms. Is that similar to what you had 10 years ago? No, ten, 10 years ago, I can't say that I really had any symptoms. Uh, the morning before uh, the doctor determined I needed stents, I had swum a mile with no symptoms. Ah, oh, I see. So how did they, they engage you and find out you had blockages and, and get involved stenting well, you? What it was, was a routine physical. And so where, you had a routine, like, stress test or something? No, it's a routine. Um, what do they do when they put the stickers? EKG? EKG. Oh, so you had some abnormality in your right. EKG. Right. And then they chased that with the exercise test? Yes. Okay, yeah, and it must have taken a lot of exercise for you. Well, it did. It uh -huh. took, I mean, I was, I was on the treadmill for like 14, 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah. They, so, they couldn't get my heart rate up. Yeah. So. It's, it's pretty hard to say somebody is sick if they can do the treadmill for 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's pretty hard to say there's something wrong with you. So those were the days when we were stenting purely on anatomy. Purely on anatomy. If you had a blockage, we see it. That's called the oculokinetic reflex. We see a blockage, we put a stent in it. And so we'll tell you, we'll show you how things have changed since then. And so let's go uh, and look some more. So basically, a physical exam is entirely normal. He's a very healthy guy. And he does have a stimulator uh, for a central tremor. And so let's talk about coronary CTA. Coronary CTA, I started doing this in 2000 and four and uh, basically compared with intravascular ultrasound we're getting pretty good information that's very useful 
in terms of the estimation of the luminal area, percentage of area stenosis, the plaque volume, plaque area, and detection of plaque, and actually the measurements as well. So there's a good correlation between coronary CTA, which is called advanced cardiac imaging, and IVIS, which is an advanced imaging also, but it's an invasive procedure. So let's look at his coronary CTA. Here's a sort of a shot of what we're interested in in his coronary CTA. We're interested in the origin of the left anterior descending. This looks like a stent, but it's not really. It's some calcification. So let's go to his actual image and uh, take a look at that. So hang on here, and we'll go find that. And so here we are. And so uh, this is a 3D volume rendered image of his heart. And you see uh, the stent in the left anterior descending, if you can see my little marker moving. And if we rotate around over here, we should be able to define his right coronary stent is in this area. There's some misregistration, so you can't see it as well as I'd like to show you. And then here's a diagonal vessel. Here's another diagonal vessel. And uh, the origin of the left hand tube descending is right up here. It's a long main left. And then the origin of the circumflex, which has a lot of calcification. So it's really hard to tell what's going on, the circumflex with all this calcium. But you can see the origin of the LED, and it looks like it's pinched down there. And it looks like there's some non-calcified plaque, very proximally, that dark appearing. We can make it look bigger. Try to magnify it a little bit more to the max here. And you can see right there, you just a little contrast coming right through there, and then darkness on both sides. We can give you a cross-section of that as well. Let's go over here and make this bigger and try to cover the coated for a cross-section. And then let's come down to that exact level, which would be right in there. And then let's color code things so they seem more distinct. Color coding. And so you see the dense calcification, which you can't see inside at all. And then you see this area that's kind of dark in there approximately, and that's got Hounsfield units of about 247, so that represents fibrous material. It's not necrotic core, but contrast, it's about 516. So when we get down in here, that's not contrast. This is contrast right in here, so, so uh, there's a little pinched area there, and so we're very concerned. So this was the first thing that we did on David when we saw him. He'd already had a cardiac cath, and he already had a nuclear skin. So let's uh, reduce this for a minute. Actually, we can go. And so we said, what is it that's been proposed for you, David? And he said, probably a couple stents, maybe one here in the circumflex and maybe one here in the left hand tube ascending. But the physician that was proposing that it didn't seem all enamored with doing that, and he said uh, that he wanted uh, Mr. Kennedy to go see a cardiac surgeon, and so he set that up uh, for a meeting with a cardiac surgeon. And so whether he wants the cardiac surgeon for backup or whether he wants the cardiac surgeon to give an alternative opinion about surgical approach, certainly a cardiac surgeon is going to say, hey, I can do surgery on you. And so... We asked Dr. Stromquist, who's an expert in angioplasty at uh, Bay Pines Hospital, the VA hospital, what his opinion was. And he looked at this, and he only saw the CT, and he's looking at the proximal LED, and he said a cutting balloon for the proximal LED. He said he was worried about snow plowing the circumflex and occluding it, so you have to put a second wire in the circumflex to keep that from happening. And uh, it's like a ping pong ball. You push one side in, the other side pops out. You push the other side in, and uh, the other side pops out. So it goes back and forth like whack-a-mole. And so uh, he was concerned about that. He also said uh, that we need to get the stent so it's really clean with the osteum instead of protruding out the main left. And that might be difficult to do, and you might wind up with two stents, a stent in the circumflex 
because of the snow plowing and the stent and the LED. He said it's risky but doable. Risky but doable. So that was the prospect. And so then uh, we also asked for a second opinion from Dr. Michael Halkos, who is at Emory University in Atlanta, and he proposed an off-pump lima to the LAD if that was a severe lesion, and that that could be done without doing open-heart surgery. It could be done with robotic harvest of the lima and then basically limited access surgery, and then patient could have stenting as well if there was another lesion such as the circumflex. So that's called the hybrid procedure because you're proceeding with both bypass surgery and stenting in the same patient. And so, well, let's look and see what the cardiac cath reported. And so I did get a copy of the disc and a copy of the cath report. And uh, the cath was reported, interestingly, in, uh, in a sort of a, a range of values. And, range of 20 to 29 percent for the main left, 60 to 69 percent for the osteo LAD, 40 to 49 percent for the mid LAD, 70 to 79 percent for the diagonal, circumflex 70 to 79 percent, and the mid right 20 to 29 percent. And so I think that reporting uh, only happens with digital angiography. So that was invented in like 1984. Uh, cardiac cath has been around since uh, the 60s, but really uh, hit its measure in 1974, and we were very active in cardiac cath at that time, and probably peaking, and are on the way to peaking with cath volume. And so, so cath's been around a long time, and uh, digital angiography uh, actually is not very accurate, even though we get these ranges, it's not very accurate. And so these are the numbers that were given to us, and uh, you have to remember that in order to have a severe stenosis, it's got to be greater than 85% uh, diameter constriction. And so none of these lesions are calculated as being 85% or greater. Uh, and so there was some question about what's really going on here. And what was recommended is possible angioplasty of the circumflex, possible lima or rima to uh, the LAD and circumflex, and then a spec scan to assess the LAD prior to any of those procedures being done to get some idea of the functional uh, significance of these anatomical lesions, since none of these lesions are actually significant since they're all less than 85%. Dr. Gould showed that you had to have an 85% diameter lesion uh, percent stenosis before you had limitation of blood flow. So the cath turns out not to be diagnostic for a flow-limiting lesion. And so that's uh, a fault of cardiac cath. Cardiac cath can be diagnostic today by doing either an FFR or an IVIS, which is intravascular ultrasound, or OCT. And we'll talk more about those and those uh, tomographic techniques and how they enhance the cath by telling you exactly what the functional significance is of these lesions. So it was an inadequate cath in terms of a wire wasn't put down and pulled back to get the pressure, or an IVUS wasn't put in. And so because of an inadequate cath, then we're resulting to a SPEC scan, which is 1990 technology, and has actually been around for 50 years. So here's a picture of the cath anatomy, and so let's go and take a look at that. I'm looking at this myself, and I really can't say that I see a severe LAD lesion or a severe circumflex lesion or a severe ramus intermedius lesion uh, or a main left. I can see there's a little taper to the main left. So let's go to uh, back for a minute and take a look at this anatomy. So here we are. We've got uh, pressure data, EKG, and we're going to look at this and play it back for you. And we're going to, we can actually slow it down a little bit would be nice. So let's slow it down. A little faster. There we go. That's good. And so let's see what we see. And so, okay, there is some narrowing here. 
and uh, you have to guess how much narrowing that is. You know, we can measure that little bit, and you can measure this little bit, and uh, do a ratio. And so if it's a ratio of 4.4 .4 pixels over 8.4 <laughs> pixels, that's about 50%. So we're getting about 50% lesion there. Whoops, I can't write with this. I was trying to write. <laughs> but 50% lesion there, and uh, that's not so bad. So, uh, and then the left anterior descending, a little bit of narrowing, but not a lot. And so uh, the main left, a little taper there, not a lot. So let's play some more. And here we go looking at the left hand to descending, which is running straight down your screen. There's a stent in there in the middle in here. There it is. I can see it. Before the injection, I can see it. So this is the stent running from here down to about here. And you can see some cross hatching of the stent. Let's play that some more. And so looking proximally at the LED and circumflex, it doesn't look so bad. More images of the same. This is a spider view. This is usually your best view. And so if you're going to measure this and compare that, measure that like that, compare that to say this, got eight, actually we've got six over 10, so 60% lesion is the best you can do there. It's really hard to say how we got these lesions that are severe and those numbers. And the right looks pretty good. There's a stent in the right proximally. So you notice the cath. I took those numbers directly from the report. And you notice that on the cath report, there's no comment about the stent to the left anterior descending or the stent to the right. That should be commented on. Here's a hand injection of the left ventricle. Why do you do a hand injection of the left ventricle if you've got perfectly good echocardiogram to look at it without injection? Well, actually the insurers pay more for putting this cath in the left ventricle than they pay for injecting the coronaries. And so if you put that in, you get more money a lot more money than you get for injecting the coronaries, which is kind of stupid because injecting the coronaries is really the risky part and the part that's more difficult. And then if you squirt a little dye in, you get paid even more. And so it's a token expression of uh, a coronary, a left ventricular gram, token expression of a left ventricular gram. So I think we've seen this enough to understand that I really can't say there's severe stenosis anywhere in these vessels from this study. And I would need to put a wire down and measure the pressure and pull it back, probably at a minimum. I certainly wouldn't make any recommendations based on what I see here. However, it may be that because the patient is having symptoms, you sort of got to look for something somewhere. But how do you know there isn't uh, some instant stenosis? The fact you can't see it doesn't mean that it's not there. You have to put a wire down the stent and pull it back and see. So let's take this one down. So let's, uh, as an exercise, let's look at uh, these arteries. They're mock-up arteries. And decide how much stenosis is here. So pretend like this is the greater part of the vessel. And this is where it's compromised and got smaller all along here and then back to normal diameter. And the same way with here, this is the normal diameter and this is where it gets smaller and then gets big again. Normal, smaller, big again. Normal, smaller, big again.
So looking at this one, I'm going to ask my student, Stephanie, what do you think the degree stenosis or narrowing is in the diameter of this one? 25. Just throw a number out. 25. 25? 25. So let's see what it really is. 33. Okay, let's go to the next one. What do you think this one is in terms of this compared to that? 50? 60. 60. Stephanie says 60, and we got 50. And what do you think the narrowing is over here? It's obviously getting more significant. 85. So let's see if the how accurate the eye is. 67. Okay, so stenosis appears to be in the eye of the beholder. How about this one where you got this little tiny, what do you think about that one? And so the 90% is 83. So our eyeballing these arteries is terribly inaccurate. Terribly inaccurate. We're not very good at this. Not even a seasoned cardiac angiographer is very good at this. So this explains why if you base what you do on your eyeball estimate of the severity of the lesion, you're not going to be taking care of severe blockages. You're just going to be taking care of stuff you see, okay, stuff you see. And so that's why that's not a very good approach. So let's go look and see what happens if you do bypasses on stuff you see and you estimate, oh, that looks pretty bad. Let's put a stent in there or let's bypass it. So let's see what happens. And so here's medical therapy compared to percent stenosis based on eyeball, quantitative, angiography, whatever you want to use. And you can see what's the mortality rate, what happens to people if you put stents in as opposed to you just treat them with medications. And you can see there's no difference between the two. Absolutely no difference in terms of the uh, survival uh, from death. But if you base the percent stenosis uh, on coronary flow by putting a pressure wire across and measuring or some other measurement of coronary flow that's very accurate, which you can get not from a spec scan, perhaps from a PET scan. If you do that, then look at the difference. You made a significant difference if you put stents in these vessels as opposed to putting stent in the eyeball estimated degree of stenosis. That's pretty dramatic, isn't it? What do you think, David? That's interesting, but... Uh... To what extent would the patients, let's say, be doing like I'm doing, which is feeling normal in everyday life, but yeah. when I'm exercising hard, which most people don't do, yes. I get significant. That's, that's called medical therapy. And so medical therapy is a drug called Ronexa. Have you been on that? No. Okay, so you've not been on medical therapy. No. So adequate medical therapy is uh, aspirin, Lipitor, uh, coronary vasodilators, and uh, a drug called ranilazine. And so what we like to do is if, if we're worried about management of symptoms, then that's called medical therapy. And there's no difference in terms of long-term mortality between management of symptoms with medical therapy and stenting. Stenting is, is not for prolonging life unless you base it on coronary blood flow, not on the eyeball measurement of the present stenosis. It's got to be based on objective information. So that's why, next slide, okay, that's why uh, if uh, you base, it, base your basis on cardiac CT, which is a much more accurate uh, surrogate for coronary blood flow that uh, basically you can show a 50% decline in fatal and non-fatal heart attacks. And so that's why we use the CT. If CT management as compared to stress test management with nuclear scanning. And so this is what happens with standard observations with nuclear scans our echo stress test. This is the mortality rate. And this is the mortality rate if you manage with CT scans. So whatever you do in terms of bypass surgery, angioplasty, or medical treatment, if you base it on the CT scan.
So the local hospital employed cardiologist reviewed the risk reward of stenting and referred the patient to a cardiac surgeon, which means he really wasn't happy with the idea of stenting the patient and thought it might be really complicated. The local cardiac surgeon discussed a lima to the LAD, possibly a rema to the circumflex, not knowing if there's really circumflex disease or not, and the virtue of surgery over stents. So what you're seeing here is mutually exclusive binary decision. You either have stenting or you have bypass surgery. We're going to show you that there's added value to a hybrid concept of doing one of each or two of each or both. And so the cardiac cath has a lot of disagreement between uh, the fractional flow reserve when you put the wire across and measure. And so let's look at that. Here's how that happens. You find this lesion and say, oh, mm, uh, I'm not sure how bad that is. And then you put uh, a wire across it and measure the pressure over here. And here's crossing the lesion. And then you give the patient a denison uh, intracoronary or IV. And then you measure the change in pressure, the change in pressure. And then we measure this change over the this difference over what the basic pressure is back here. So you put this pressure over that pressure and you get the FFR. The FFR is basically a measurement of coronary blood flow. That's what we needed basically in this case was to put this wire across, inject some adenosine, draw it back and see the difference between this pressure over that pressure, which would be this pressure over that pressure or this pressure over that pressure to begin with. Okay. And so uh, that's the FFR. And that also can be calculated using a supercomputer off the CT scan. And let's skip this slide and move over here. So here's a patient that has an FFR of 0.50. However, the stenosis is only about 67% when we measured that uh, in terms of diameter. And so there's a difference between uh, this being 67%, we said it has to be 85% before it'll be significant, but it turns out if there's a large lipid plaque there and a large lipid pool, that uh, that doesn't dilate as well with the adenosine. And so that's a more significant lesion, less significant stenosis, but more significant because of its composition. So that's how CT management makes a difference is by looking at composition of plaques. So as far as the spec scan, I haven't done a spec scan in 10 years. Dr. Lieberman said he hasn't done a spec scan at Emory since 1995. Why aren't we doing spec scans anymore? Well, it's 50-year-old technology. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, just look at your watch and uh, just look at your phone uh, and just look at your computer and you'll see what's wrong with 50-year-old technology. And so it doesn't actually fit with the FFR. So if the FFR is the bottom line uh, and the spec scan doesn't match with that, then the spec scan isn't useful. And so, yes, you can do it. Yes, it's kind of standard of care because it's maintained as standard of care by the insurance companies. And the insurance companies, for some perverse reason, say they won't pay for the other test, but they'll pay for this one. And so it maintains a standard of care that would evolve into something else if the insurance companies have allowed it and paid for it. And actually, the insurance companies, the most perverse thing is they think they're saving money by doing the spec scans and not doing PET CTs and MRI. And actually, they're losing money. So that makes it even more perverse. So it shows, according to uh, one research study, which was called the FAME study, which based surgery and angioplasty and stenting on the FFR, that showed that 50% of stented vessels didn't need stents. Okay, They were stented because of the eyeball, hey, that looks like a bad stenosis, which uh, doesn't make a bit of difference in terms of taking care of patients. So. It turns out that most cardiac cath labs, when they do a cardiac cath on the patient, about 60% of patients 
don't have anything on their cardiac cath. So those would be called negative casts. And they got there because they had diagnostic tests called spec scans that were false positive. False positive in males because their stomach in the way. False positive in females because of breast. And so, and then patients who get the false negatives have a false sense of reassurance of being okay. So what's the false positive rate of spec scans? Well, it's 40%, according to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. What's the false negative rate of spec scans? That would be of 100 people, you know, who have heart disease. How many are told they don't have heart disease? And that turns out to be 65. So 65 out of 100 who have heart disease are missed by the spec scan. And 40 of 100 who don't have heart disease are told that they do by the spec scan. So it's a worthless test. Let's look at digital quantitative coronary angiography, that's the so-called eyeball test, and let's compare it to a couple other objective tests for measuring the percent diameter stenosis. And this one is called the IVIS, and this is called the, the optical coherent tomography, OCT. So we've got these two tests that can actually estimate things in terms of micrometers. They can actually show you micrometers in terms of accuracy. And so let's take an eyeball 50 to 70 percent lesion and here they are. These are all those. And let's measure the FFR across those lesions and you'll find that most of them are normal. Okay? 50 to 70 percent. Those are most of the lesions that were found on David's cardiac cath. Let's go over here and say, okay, let's overlap. Let's take 71 to 90 percent. How many of these, estimated by eyeball, are really normal? Well, it turns out 20 percent are really normal. And then how about 91 to 99 percent? Well, only 4 percent are normal there, based on IVIS or OCT. So when we get down in this 50 to 70 percent range, we're getting uh, a strong number of patients don't have much of anything by FFR. So if we go back to our original cardiac cath data and look at our numbers again, and there's our numbers, the only numbers that really might mean anything are these two. And uh, we're still very unsure of how severe those are based on not the eyeball test but some kind of computer quantitative digital angiography which was developed in 1984. So we're talking old technology. So we asked Dr. Lieberman, a third cardiologist, to look at the circumflex on the cardiac cath and say, do you see a severe stenosis? Okay? Do you see a 70 to 79 percent? He said no. Okay, we said, well, let's look at the CT, and he said, yeah, it looks like on the osteo LED on the CT scan, it does look like, according to my eyeball, it looks like a severe lesion, but I don't see anything there. All right, well, let's get somebody else. Okay, so we got Dr. Morales. Do you see a severe stenosis in the circumflex? Dr. Morales says no either. So you can see why you need the FFR. I mean, here's a difference of opinion. We got three people saying there's nothing there. And we got a, one, another cardiologist saying it's a 70 to 79 percent lesion. So you can see if you just follow your eyeballs, and if it's in the eye of the beholder, you're going to get a lot of stents that people really don't need. So let's move on and talk about hybrid surgery. What is hybrid surgery? Hybrid surgery is, well, it was developed because of this, that it's a less invasive procedure because it's not on the heart-lung machine. Their good outcomes with minimally invasive coronary artery bypass grafting have been demonstrated in the past. Me mediocre outcomes have been seen with saphenous vein grafts. You know, we had somebody two weeks ago who had five bypass grafts that were veins that were put in uh, and who a week later was found to have all his grafts closed. It was an eight-hour procedure. And so mediocre outcomes with saphenous vein grafts 
improve results with angioplasty using drug-eluting stents. And so that makes hybrid coronary revascularization a very attractive proposal where the surgeons and cardiologists will work together. And the surgeon will harvest the left hand tear descending uh, vessel bypass by getting a lima from inside the chest wall robotically, which is minimally invasive, without being on the heart lung machine, and hooking it up to the LAD with a small keyhole incision. Wow. No wonder there's less bleeding, less complications, and you go home sooner and you go to work faster. Sounds like a pretty good idea. And there's a couple other vessels, and you just pick them up with some stents. You put some stents in there, and so you got the best of both worlds. And so uh, why doesn't everyone do that? Well, it certainly takes a substantial commitment to open heart surgery. So if you are seeing that we have all these centers, are they willing to invest $3 million in a hybrid room? And each one of them has two surgeons. And if we've got the decline of bypass surgery, which is the blue line, are those hospitals going to invest $3 million for those cardiac surgeons? And we have, these are the only guys that have been able to get that kind of stuff. Why can they get it? Because they have high volume centers that have been preserved and they're offering lower mortality surgery because of their high volume. So basically, David, you're not going to be offered that because they're not going to have that. And they're not going to have that because it's a small hospital with a token cardiac surgical program because that's where the money is, correct? So let's look at the hybrid surgery. Emory University has the largest experience in the world. There's decreased length of stay, decreased bleeding and transfusions, decreased surgical complications. You wouldn't want those things, would you, David? No. No, David wouldn't want that. <laughs> Hybrid surgery is a combination of coronary bypass and angioplasty. The minimally invasive bypass procedure uses robotic-assisted techniques that allow surgery to be performed using a small incision between the ribs rather than a midline incision dividing the sternum. And you don't need the heart-lung machine, which causes pump head and all other kinds of problems post-op, including strokes. The recovery from robotic-assisted coronary bypass graft is shorter Expect it to have fewer complications. As a matter of fact, you could go back and go swimming because you haven't had your sternum dissected and you're not wired back together again. Impressively, most patients are able to leave the hospital within three to four days and return to full activity, including work, in two to three work weeks rather than two months recovery generally required for traditional bypass grafting. And we compare that not to other university bypass programs, but to community bypass programs with low volume, it's a home run, definitely a home run. Now let's look at the hybrid surgery. Optimal therapy with its minimally invasive approach translates into shorter recovery time, meaning patients can return home a few days after surgery. Potentially fewer complications, quicker return to work. Emory is one of the few centers in the nation offering hybrid coronary revascularization. Emory physicians are leaders in pre performing advanced procedures off pump in a minimally invasive fashion without breaking open the chest wall as finding new and innovative ways to treat patients. That sounds like a good idea to me. Here's a doc that does them. He's done 150 robotic assisted coronary bypass procedures in less than two years. Well, let's see. It's hard to find cardiac surgeons in community hospitals who've done 150 of anything in less than two years. So, and here's the, he actually has published his reports and they're available for discussion and for review in the medical literature and nationally by your peers. In partnership with fellow cardiac surgeon, Dr. Haukos, Dr. Puskas has been involved. Henry Lieberman is the cardiologist. They all put the stents in. They've been doing this as the busiest center in the world uh, for hybrid surgery. So that's why it's particularly attractive. Hybrid surgery may represent a safe, less invasive alternative to conventional coronary bypass in carefully selected patients with similar short-term 
and midterm outcomes as coronary artery bypass performed with either by a single internal memory or bilateral internal memory, depending on the physiological significance of the anatomical lesions, not the eyeball significance of the coronary artery lesions. The physiological significance is huge. Let's highlight that, highlight that. Okay, we're going to highlight it. Boop, boop, there you go. Huge. So let's look over here. Complication of cath is a non-diagnostic cath. If you have a non-diagnostic cath, then it's got to re be repeated. So David's going to have his cardiac cath repeated again to get the diagnosis because we still don't have the diagnosis. So it needs to be repeated with physiological data. That's the point. you got to have the physiological data. Without that, we have nothing. We don't know what he needs, what needs to be done. So when you get in there and you got the anatomy, you can put an IVUS in the left hand two descending. You could put a OCT, which is the coherent tomography. You can put that in there and look at it and make micrometer pictures of the of the diameter and of the cross sectional area of the lesion. Or you can consider put the wire down pull it back and do a pressure pullback with the denison on board and get the FFR. You can do that on the LED, you can do the circumflex. If severe LED disease, you can harvest a lima off pump, non-sternotomy, local incision, anastomose to the LED. If there's a severe circumflex lesion, you can use a cutting balloon and put a stent in. So, not bad, not bad. And then what about dual antiplatelet therapy? And dual, Dave is concerned about developing little uh, bruising situations on his arm where he bleeds into it because of having a stent. And for a drug eluding stents, actually it can be three months. If you have stable heart disease, it can be three to six months. So let's put that up there, three to six months. And so you can abbreviate that to three months according to the new standards. If it's thrombosis, then it's got to be a year. Otherwise, three to six months for drug eluding stent. So that's not bad. You can dodge that. You don't have to be on that long term. And so uh, basically, in conclusion, we offer that a diagnostic cath needs to have physiological data. You can't substitute a 50-year-old technology spec scan for physiological data. So, and a complication of cardiac cath, it's not completing a diagnostic procedure. You're in there taking all the risk without the benefit of a diagnosis. So the eyeball test doesn't hack it anymore. FFR, IVUS, OCT, we also have PET scans. Uh, cardiac CT is a very, very useful screening procedure. FFR can also be calculated off the CT scan, which is new technology. And alternative to conventional bypass surgery, alternative to uh, stenting of that patient is not to make a binary decision, this or that, but to be able to do both in a special operating room where you can see here's the operating room lights for doing surgery and here's the C arm for doing angioplasty. So you can actually do the surgery, harvest the lima, put uh, the lima bypass into the LED at the same time then someone can inject that, see how it looks, make sure the anastomosis is good, then inject the circumflex, put a catheter in, use a cutting balloon, and put a stent in the circumflex, all at one procedure in one room. Fantastic. Do you have any questions? Hello there, Ben at Point. Do the residents have any questions about this? Uh, no, pretty interesting. Um, Following along, kind of Googling things along the way. Um, up and direct, but thank you. Very good. Do you feel like... Uh, Cardiology is very slow getting out of the starting gate in new technology. No, I mean, my, well, I did CT surgery in uh, in um, uh, Blake, my medical school rotation, 
Um, it was like kind of like their second month or first month doing a, like some of these things are talking about it, like the hybrid OR and stuff like that at least. And so uh, I think it's moving pretty fast. Um, uh, you know. And how about cardiology in terms of doing a, a procedure that's actually obsolete, the spec scan? Where do you see what do you see happening actually in the hospitals? Well, yeah, it's interesting how the insurance kind of drives that. Um, but uh, understanding more about why sometimes cats are, are staged, you know, the diagnostic cats, that was uh, interesting to hear about that a bit more and seeing the OCT and kind of knew about the FFR, I thought. And, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so you're asking me about that spec? Yeah, I mean, it seems like insurance is going to drive that. Um, I don't know. Well, thank you so much for attending. I appreciate that. Thank you. See you later. Bye-bye. See you next week. Bye. Thank you very much, Dr. Anderson. Thank you, Hassan, and I'm going to stop recording.